Can the four of you see the screen? <laughs> <laughs> and our audience at home. And our audience at home. Yeah. My friends want to watch it. <laughs> Um, I think you should introduce Are you a moderator? Yes. I will let you moderate. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Costuming Tips. Uh, it's a, uh, this format will be a panelist uh, presenting for about 15 minutes and then opening up for questions and answers. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, ask the panelists to introduce themselves and, and uh, we'll kind of get to the, the topic. So. Hi, um, I'm Sadia They Them. Um, I work for the Wayfinder Experience Summer Camp and also am a founder and owner of Event Horizon Lark. Um, I am a costumer and an aesthetic designer, um, and I'm going to be talking more about Lark from um, a designer and organizer standpoint. Or, sorry, more about costume design from that standpoint. Um, hi, I'm Raquel Skellington, and I'm a professional model, and I'm also a work influencer, um, and I do impressive. Um, I basically um, design costumes and do aesthetic, also like aesthetic design, character design, and development. Um, and I'll be talking about, you know, uh, what key elements you know can make a great character look, and what makes them a memorable character through design. Hi, I'm Lee Foxworthy. Uh, Keep them pronouns. I uh, am a lark designer and writer, and also have a background in theater and do costuming for myself and others. Uh, everything I'm going to present today is work that I have done for me. Um, but my topics that I'm presenting on are designing a costume on a budget and um, reusing and recycling old costume pieces and, this, uh, and using non conventional uh, mediums to create costumes. So that uh, people, I think anybody can costume, but I'll do that. I mean, you're the one who has this up. Yeah, you're sure. I'm going to go for it. All right, so uh, costuming tips, and like I said, we're going to talk mostly about how to do this on a budget, how to do it with previous videos and costuming things. Um, so, live in San Antonio, Texas. Um, at 14 years of life experience in the US, UK, and Sweden, uh, theater in high school and college, uh, focus on costuming on a budget, thrifting, and repurposing. I do fantasy, urban fantasy, post-apocalyptic, and modern costuming. I believe that costuming should be accessible to everyone and that with some luck and creativity, anyone can produce quality costumes. Uh, I will be discussing things that revolve around the idea that anyone can create the look that they desire for their life experience. Um, first, to get good results, you need time and patience as well as an open mind. Um, dress for the event and don't sacrifice your well-being for a second. Living in Texas, we often have uh, temperatures over 100 degrees. Um, so, dressing for the event is very important and a place where you will pass out complete exhaustion. Uh, repurposing and thrifting are great ways to get good casting, and makeup requires practice and patience for many, many hours on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> so true. Yes. Okay, so uh, time and patience. Um, this particular piece, um, the horns are a $13 uh, Halloween horn. Put onto a two dollar headband, uh, and then pick up clearance flowers from like a craft store, uh, and then with a lot of string and hot glue, uh, was able to make it to where they didn't look like they had um, the, the insertion point was hidden, to where if you were wearing a wig or if you had enough hair like I used to in this picture, you couldn't see the insertion points, and it, everyone is um, kind of wowed by the magic of this piece because you can't see where the horns are coming from, so it looks very organic and it cost me all $20 to make this piece. Um, and the makeup is, uh, this one I actually did uh, with no costume makeup. I do costume and makeup later, but this one is literally this black eyeliner, brown eyeshadow, and then highlighter for the like, you can't really see it in this resolution. It was like that one across the forehead, the deer spots. Um, and you can get the same ones for Halloween face palette. And if you wait till November 1st, you can buy all of the theater and costume makeup for ridiculously cheap when those little public Halloween stores are trying to clear out those stuff. So um, I definitely like November 1st is my favorite day of the year because I go and I just, I just if I see something that I think is going to inspire me for a costume, I go and I just go to the costume shop and I go buy all of the stuff that they're selling for like a dollar or two dollars. Not that I need more costumes if I'm at home, but you know, I'll find a way to use it. So that's for the event. No amount of realism, what you see is what you get, or genre is worth your well-being. The player is always more important. 
This includes authenticity, unless your event specifically requires it. There's no reason you can't um, crop or dummy something up to look just like you want it. Chainmail is heavy, and I have spray painted plastic chainmail for next to that, so this is plastic and weighs ounces. Like, and it is a uh, neck piece, and it goes down to the chest, especially you don't want to your shirt. And uh, this uh, is literally snaps together. Um, it's little plastic chain belt pieces. And if you, like here, I sprayed it, and then I took it and rubbed it across the concrete to uh, basically muss up the paint and give it a little bit of a worn look. Um, so uh, the lantern is because it was for a specific character in uh, across the country. But uh, she, the faction that this player has, the lantern is their symbol, so that's why it's a lantern. And then actually that lantern lights up, and the, the wiring goes behind it, and you can just put the wiring, uh, like, just inside your shirt, when you have like, a shirt pocket, like, it can fit in the pocket very easily. So. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Which get to the Um, uh, the <laughs> They, uh, supply a lot of stuff for the Lord of the Rings <laughs> Yes. Uh, they do, they have everything from, like, butted mail and anodized, uh, scale mail and all kinds of stuff. Um, I love their stuff. I do, since I do, um, some SEA style things where it was important. I've also made actual chain mail and actual scale mail that's significantly more heavy than this plastic stuff. So if you're doing fantasy where you need chain mail, but authenticity isn't required, so there's some events where authenticity is required, but if it's not, it's on plastic ones. They also have plastic scale mail. It doesn't, this is easy because it snaps together. The plastic scale mail uh, is a little more difficult to work with, but if you just watch a few videos, you can master it in about 10 minutes. How is that stuff for like bigger pieces? like? You get a shirt, like, I, I had an aluminum shirt, and the bottom sections and under the arms kept So, I actually made a shirt, um, a actually full tunic, out of the larger plastic ring, so the plastic ring was coming in the visors. Okay. And what we did was, because of those things, we did laces um, on the side of the torso, okay. uh, but left the front and the back, like, the full uh, chain. That way, it wasn't rubbing and being on. Um, so we I, so basically we just modified the piece since realism wasn't something that was needed. So we just left the side out and just laced it, like cross laced it, uh, to hold it together. In a sense. So, Thank you. Yeah, and just re, we double we uh, kind of <coughs> double reinforced the rings on that part so it can support the lacing. But yeah, huh. like you can use it for any size of pieces. So plastic chain mill for me as a fantasy costumer is a staple because it's so old. Yeah. So incredible. Uh, repurposing and so uh, here I have like a these were made from couch cushions. These things the, with the hips and the leggings that go up. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I know. No, they're not. So this is fur. This oh. okay. This is actually it looks really warm, but this is actually mesh. And so um, it, it looks really warm and on the outside of your one's really leg, but where on the inside of your legs and up through your hips, this is mesh. That fabric is a mesh. Um, and I just painted it to look spotted. And then uh, took hot glue <laughs> with this fur and taped it over shaped couch cushions. I usually I literally just do the couch cushion and figured out how far I wanted the leggings to go out. And then cut the couch cushions, and then cut another one from the other side, and then hot glued that fur down, and then sewed the inside of the fur to the to the to the netting. Okay, so this is an apocalyptic character from Dystopia Rising, um, and uh, which uh, the character type is called a natural one, and so they're kind of tribalish. So I recycled pieces from the tribal costume to the darker satyr costume. Um, to So I used to do it with the corset, and then I am male now, and corsets are not fun. So <laughs> I modified this to be part of this same costume with a completely different look. So these are both the satyr costume. This is the like a uh, dappling with uh, the, the eyeliner and stuff, and then this is more costume makeup, but kind of like dark satyr, like wooded, um, kind of thing, and then the, the, the this piece here, and then also, it's not really high resolution, but there's a belt that also came from the same costume. So a completely different genre is recycled the pieces, um, and it was able to create the kind of look that I wanted. Um, so uh, thrift stores are like my favorite place on the planet, and people, uh, they, 
like some people are like wary about going to a thrift store to get costuming. Um, and I can understand my solution is just wash it. Like just wash it. <laughs> uh, but the number of times that I've had pieces that I bought the base for it from like a thrift store, I, I can't even tell you. Like um, everything from like I did like a zombie bride dress where I took like a um, like homecoming dress that had been like given to a thrift store and like tore it up and helped to do like a zombie homecoming queen type thing for somebody. But like you can create any costume for about fifty dollars or less. Which, in the costume world, that's very cheap. It's very. It takes patience and a lot of looking. So um, you're not going to find what you want every time, and you're not going to find what you want in every story. You just got to plan and be patient, and you know, kind of look for what you're wanting ahead of time. And eventually, you'll find something that works for you. Okay. So these are some other pieces and looks that I have created. Um, this is entirely just makeup. Uh, I, in Texas, I don't want to wear hair. <laughs> that is not a thing I want to do. So this is um, a facial hair uh, technique that um, I literally just use a bruise wheel and a stubby sponge to create facial hair. Um, and then, of course, like setting, like blending and setting spray and stuff to make it look more realistic, but like when we get to 110 degrees, I do not. <laughs> to wear actual hair on my face. Uh, and then additionally, uh, this piece here, talking about recycling old things. So I had a, a pair of old Doc Martin boots that were completely torn up and unusable. So I cut off the top of them and made bracers <laughs> to go onto this jacket. Yeah, uh, and so this blue uh, was actually a really ugly cream upholstery fabric that I found that like the whole piece was being sold for like $3. So then I painted it, that turquoise, and then did the like detailing work. Uh, sewed, so I had found some like white satin and did that as the lining, but then took it out to also be the lapels. Um, and then this is just like random little breads and brass pieces and then blood stains. And uh, it's also for post apocalyptic stuff, which is this character. This character um, was for a werewolf game. Uh, specifically, uh, if you're familiar with White Wolf, uh, this character was a Fianna. <coughs> And this was done with basically, I bought this shirt for $2 at a thrift store, I made this necklace, um, and then this is, the makeup is liquid latex. So, um, and it's a like impactful, like visual um, costume, costing me about the $5. Um, here's a little more of my makeup work. Um, so this character, uh, all of these are actually me pretty recently. Um, stuff like this, scar work, you can learn that in five minutes. This is uh, liquid colloidin, which, uh, so I put pink lipstick, covered it with liquid colloidin, and it is a believable aged scar. Um, and then that is just uh, water activated and I make up for the, the tribal paint. And then this here is my new current favorite product, this one is a, the Maroon Paradise AQ uh, highly pigmented uh, stuff. And the thing is, is if you use it lightly, it looks like a skin stain. Um, and you can wear it and it doesn't rub off as long as you don't get it like really wet. Like you can still sweat in it and it won't smudge, but if you actually like put water on it, it will. But it looks more like a skin stain. And on the next slide, I'll show you what that character is for because I needed a character that could have sort of rainbow tinted skin <clears throat> that I could wear easily. Um, Paradise AQ. Paradise AQ, thank you. All right. So, uh, this is the rainbow skin character. Um, she's a, it's kind of hard to explain, but basically I needed her to have rainbow skin. <laughs> and um, the technique here with the flowers coming, or the, sorry, the feathers coming out of the skin is done with um, prosade, scar wax, um, and a makeup foundation to cover the, the edge of that, and then again the Paradise AQ for the um, for the skin tone. Um, but that technique um, and being able to put it on a part of my body that moved, uh, Spirit Gum isn't going to hold at an event where you need to move a lot. Um, so I highly, highly recommend Prosade. 
uh, get the remover because otherwise the residue will never come off your skin. <laughs> it's a hard time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, this is this is a really fun uh, technique. Uh, I prefer coconut oil as the thing that I use to work with my scar wax with um, because I'm not allergic to it. Um, other oils uh, uh, treat my skin differently, but coconut oil I can use pretty easily. Um, again, the, this was done with a Ben Nye palette. Um, this was done with a Breeze Wheel, and then this one was done with the Paradise AQ uh, thing. Let's see. All right, so um, things that I've made pops out of <laughs> leather remnants, duct tape, an old corset, and a trapper keeper, uh, bags from old costumes, and stitch witch, PVC pipe, ribbons, and wool fabric. So um, the shield here lasted for me for four years in a buffer life, like a, at, at DR. Four full years was made out of pink foam, duct tape, and a like leveling. Uh, what it was called? Like we go to the trowel. yeah the trowel. It was the handle with a old backpack um, thing as the strap to hold it. So a trowel, a backpack strap, duct tape, and pink foam, and that was it. It wasn't bolted, <clears throat> nothing like, um, and still lasted me for four <clears throat> years. So like that shield cost me all of twenty dollars and lasted me four. Uh, the way that we did the decal was we had a sliding glass screen door and made the decal on the, the sliding glass screen door, pulled the decal off, and then put it on the thing because we had to take an X-Acto knife to get some of the details with the duct tape, but used a screen door, put it on the screen door, cut out the design we wanted, peeled it off, and put it onto the, onto the shield. You painted the screen door. No, no, it's duct tape. A glass oh. door. It's all tape. It's all duct tape. Oh. That's literally all duct tape. That whole, all the decal, everything is duct tape. Oh, that's kind of brilliant. Yeah, because the duct tape will stick to itself, and right. like it, you know, once if you um, take a shape. hair dryer or just even just rub it and you heat up the adhesive. So we just took a hair dryer and like that, the decals never came off. So. And, and it's in the core is foam. The core is pink foam. Mm -hmm. The core is pink foam. Yeah, the core is pink foam. Mm -hmm. So it's light and awesome. Yeah. Awesome. It's incredibly light. So I have <laughs> I have a metal awesome. plate and six screws on my left arm. I can't carry yeah. a lot of weight. So like even when I do impact play at, at like Camp Guard or Dagger here, I can't do the shield play because my arm can't physically support that weight. So I design around things like that. So I have another character, which is the, the male character with the, a face paint that um, does printing. Like with calligraphy and that kind of stuff. So I took paper and I genreed it with tea. Um, and then I had an old trapper keeper and an old corset. So in order to make a fun and aesthetically pleasing book for them to print in, I took and I hot glued the corset to the outside of the trapper keeper because the corset had a zipper. So if I zipped up the corset, it closed the print book. And it was just two things I had lying around that made a ridiculously cool prop for that character. Um, so. Bags um, from old costumings and stitch witch. Uh, so this um, shoulder and back piece here was literally like a really cute bag that I then cut up and then stitched witch tons on to be able to have like another layer to this costume. I put this costume together in about 10 minutes. Um, I took Sharpies and made the design on the umbrella, just literally opened the umbrella and drew the design with Sharpies. Um, we had another prop that we had to make. We had to make a 10 foot tall uh, maypole for the natural one character, which is that one, the shield. And um, like we're like, okay, how are we going to get a 10-foot tall pole that is transportable and can be brought back and forth to side? So I took uh, two foot lengths of PVC, uh, female and male joints, and made a 10-foot tall pole that was collapsible because we could just take it apart. Problem is, they don't sell five-way connectors every day at the like store. You have to order them, and we needed it like right now. So we took a center uh, core and four elbow joints and just did two cross bolts to be able to make an X space to hold the, the thing up. Okay, now we have a plastic pole, which clearly isn't the right kind of aesthetic for you know, a white plastic pole is gonna work. You can't spray paint plastic. I mean, you can if you want to sand it and prime it. It takes a lot of work. Instead, I took some really old fabric and made it into a tube and then just pulled it over the top of the white pole and then ta-da, we had the prop that we needed with a 20 minute trip to Home Depot to be able to put PVC pipe together. So have an open mind. Sometimes your solutions are gonna be a little unorthodox. Like being able to like, oh, let's put PVC pipe together to be able to fit it all in a tent bag. So we put all of the pieces, everything we needed in a tent bag. 
we had drilled holes through the four-way base to put um, tent spikes through it so it would keep it in the ground. But uh, it's, um, so being on a budget because um, when most of this was happening, I was working basically a little bit more than minimum wage. And so everything I had to do was on a budget. And so now I can afford if I want whatever fabric I want or I have a much better job. But then we had to figure out everything with kind of unorthodox solutions because I didn't have the money to buy a lot, um, a lot of the things that I can afford now. Wood sand, PVC, sand, yeah, but then it requires sanding a lot of PVC for a 10 foot tall pole. <laughs> yeah, because um, I have sanded buckets and stuff to make little chairs out of. And... Okay, cool. Things I've learned you should not do. <laughs> um, wear fur when it's 100 degrees outside. Uh, pretend that I am not cold when I'm freezing because it would ruin the look. <laughs> Yeah, uh, wear full face makeup to an all day event. Um, and I don't mean just, so like the, the Paradise Nikki stuff that's really light, but I'm talking about like really intense like prosthetics and like, you know, like more core uh, SFX stuff. Yep, no, I was not a happy camper by the end of that day. That was, uh, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, if you, like, if you're going to a panel where you want to wear it for that, that's fine, but I, I cannot wear the prosthetics and stuff all day long because you do sweat underneath the, the latex or whatever you're making it out of. Uh, secure anything by simply tying it in a knot. Um, they can and won't fall off. So even if you're doing like the tribal belt thing where you have like just trinkets and, and furs and stuff, like please actually either grab it or sew it on. Um, don't, uh, so I uh, make sure you always spot test your makeup for allergies because um, anything with a fragrance in it in the United States is not regulated. And like the fragrance is not regulated and you don't know what chemicals are in it. And sometimes um, people will put fragrances in makeup or they'll put chemicals in makeup that you've never encountered before. Even if you think, oh, I don't have sensitive skin, I'm not allergic to anything, there's probably something you're allergic to. So, um, overcomplicate over costuming to the exclusion of participation on alert. Mm -hmm. So my costuming is too cumbersome or too delicate for me to be able to run around. Um, so don't overcomplicate it to the point where you can't participate. Um, assume I can figure it out and not read directions or ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at this list and I'm like, oh god, I, I still do all of these things right now. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I do all. I've broken all these rules. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, wait, <laughs> do one of them. Yeah. <laughs> still do. Think wings are ever a good idea in the large. <laughs> wait, you see one of the costumes I'm gonna show you. It's always, it looks so cool. It's so cumbersome. And sometimes you get stuck in doorways. Yep. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. You gotta learn to walk sideways. You, you have to learn to like ah, yeah. walk sideways, yeah. Sit down in chairs correctly. But yeah. Like, like you have to sit down in chairs this way. Like you can't have anything with the back, you have to turn sideways. And if you do, you have to be like, you have to put on how you build the wings. <laughs> you have to like, yeah. sit like that. Yeah, so um, these are the things that I've learned. Um, my costuming has gotten better and better over the years. I did a lot of work with theater. I did a lot of work with improv. And um, I, I love creating costumes for people and helping them and consulting them. Uh, especially like if you just tell me what's your budget, I can usually help you figure out a solution. And also ask your friends. Ask your friends. Uh, not just me, but like look around in your community and you see people who have like these really cool props. Uh, or really cool costuming, it is likely that they have a really interesting story about how it happened, like duct tape and pink foam and PVC pipes. So, <laughs> uh, back when, I want to go back. I want to go back. Okay, credits. Um, and this is important to me because my, my friends are amazing. Uh, Heather Halstead did all of the dystopia rides and pictures, which was like three quarters of the picture there were all done by Heather Halstead. Um, she has a website, she does professional photography at LARPs. She does, if you have a really cool LARP character and you need a photo shoot of that character, she does personal photo shoots for people, so Heather Hulse is amazing. Seth Fogarty is my partner in everything, and he did all the Seder photos for me. Mallory McKinney helped me with the Seder horns, and she does um, leather work for people, um, and she's incredible. Uh, Ryan Wilson was the person who helped me with the decals on the tri tribal shield, and Brandon Lee was the person who helped me to sew the upholstery fabric because I did not have a machine that could sew through upholstery fabric. So uh, those people, uh, I would not be able to do all of this without them. And then this is my contact information. Um, either of those you can get a hold of me. And of course, this presentation will be up on Living Games website after um, 
if you want to see some of those photos in a little bit better resolution, um, it'll be up on the website after the convention is over. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I guess if I may steal your seat, I'm going to just... I'm just going to bring up my Instagram and we're going to talk about some things. <laughs> okay, I will get you. You can just Google my name and I'll get my Instagram. <laughs> I'm going to get you on Google and that way my stuff is no longer on Perfect. Okay, pitch. Okay, so uh, first things first, hi everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Raquel. I can go by Raquel Skellington online. That's my professional channel. Um, so costuming. Um, that's really cool. I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> Might be because Sarah has Googled you before. <laughs> So they look really official, um, and they look like they are not nerds. Oh my God! When you put two closet nerds together, you get turbo nerd, and that's me. Um, <laughs> hold on, I'm just looking for very specific. I think you need a few more pictures on your Instagram. <laughs> I know. Um, um, I am a professional model, by the way. So a lot of my here we go. So. Um, this character, actually right here, uh, I'm like 15, 16 years old in this, photo, in this photo. My birthday's tomorrow, so I turn 22 tomorrow, by the way. Thank Happy you. birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, when it comes to design, um, and one of the, I think, key aspects when it comes to character design is, yes, you want a costume, right? Either a costume on a budget or, you know, not on a budget. It depends who you are. But what's important, regardless of how much money you spend, is how to make that character iconic, memorable, like people should be able to look at you and know who you are. Or be like, oh, that's so-and-so. Or if they see you from across the field, be like, oh, that's what's-its-face. Or, you know, if you have a, a prop that you carry with you, if you were to leave that prop on the table, people go, oh shit, that's, that's so-and-so's. You want to have um, key elements to a character and in the design that makes them that character. For instance, a great example of this is that there's always um, anywhere between one to three key pieces to a character that makes them that character. For instance, Indiana Jones. When you think Indiana Jones, right, you can fudge the pants, you can fudge the shirt. You know what matters? The hat and the whip. That's it. The two elements of that costume that make Indiana Jones is the hat and the whip. That's all you need. So, you know, if you, um, it, it's also kind of like, you know, even Princess Leia, right? Sure, you can kind of fudge the dress a little bit, as long as it's white, right? That's what we know, it has to be like a cool white space looking dress. It's the hair, it's her hair. That like, you see that anywhere, you're like, oh, that's, that's like, that's Princess Leia, like, of course, right? So this character here is my very first LARP character. I have a wee baby here, it's my very first LARP, and this is the first professional photo I ever took. Um, and this was my character, Alicia Dura. Um, and the costume I put together, uh, I, was a, I was a high school kid and I took all the money I had saved and I went to my, um, my policy of EEA, eBay, Etsy, Amazon. <laughs> that's, that's it. This entire <laughs> costume was made off of eBay. Everything. The wig, the headpiece, the cloak, the corset. And I mean like these are cheap elements like the, uh, this costume altogether probably cost me close to like 70 bucks, which for a high school kid, that's a lot of money, okay? That was like, uh, they saved up for like months and months and months and months and begged my mom to buy me a belt, you know, kind of thing. Like the frying pan that I'm holding is, a, is a, a latex frying pan that I can actually fight with. That was my Christmas present for my mom because I baked for it. I was like, mom, can I please have a fake frying pan for Christmas? She's like, what? I'm like, please, you don't understand. Um, but yeah, and these are all my friends. Actually, this is my friend Pierce. We went to high school together. And uh, that's, that's how it started. I started in high school, we would go to the LARPs after high school, one of our parents would have to drive us, and the parents would take turns taking us to the game. Um, and my character literally wore all white. That was like, that was her shtick. 
she was all white, white hair, white outfit, white everything, and I bleached everything super hard after going to the events that it stayed white. Um, and I had this little lantern. And this lantern um, became synonymous with my character. If I left that on the table, people knew I was in danger, something was wrong, I was kidnapped. Why would Alicia not have her lantern? That's like the thing, right? So, you know, it's creating these elements that, that can show people, no matter what, it's um, visual cues that like people who remember and associate with your character that is really important in the concept of design. Um, so, like, I always start with a drawing. Um, this is my uh, character design for Fairweather Manor. I went last year in 2017. I love the time period. I have a minor in um, fashion history, and I, I also go to school for graphic design. Um, and I always start, you see that, like, that's on, on the page that I didn't take a photo of. Um, I, I run through hundreds, tens of hundreds of dress designs. Um, and what I tend to do nowadays, and I, and I have the luxury of doing this because I also like costume and model and everything full time. And I understand that that's not a possibility for everybody or that's not what everybody does. But I, I design each and every one of my costumes. So for instance, if I create a dress, right? If I, I want to bring that dress to life or something like it from the time period. I will sit there, run through designs, then I usually work with a seamstress. And what I think is really important is that if you work with, a seamstress is not always a designer. It's not synonymous, okay? So the seamstress is really good at putting things together. Um, and then you can be the designer or you can work with a seamstress who's also a fashion designer. Um, so what I tend to do is I design the entire outfit, I write up the patterns, and I give it to a seam, I buy the fabric, and I give it to a seamstress to put it together, because normally I don't have enough time to do that myself. But also I would do a crappy job, and probably just hot glue everything and it would look like a, like a mess. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's actually me. Um, so talking about uh, costuming, Okay, actually, talking about Dystopia Rising, this is fantastic. This is my character, Dexter. Um, I don't really play Dystopia Rising anymore, but she was the character I played for the longest amount of time. And um, she had these, you know, big, uh, actually more fawn ears, these big fawn ears that had this blue hair and these dark, dark eyes, right? These coon eyes. Um, everything that I'm wearing, I thrift it. And it's just bleach washed. That's it. That whole outfit that I'm sitting there um, is also made up of old clothes I wouldn't wear anymore. Uh, like stuff from when I was, you know, I'm probably about 17 in this photo, or 18, and um, this is all stuff that I wore, you know, maybe in my early high school years that I still fit into, and I just, I wasn't going to wear it anymore, so I just bleached the crap out of it. Um, and, and the, the uh, sweater that I'm wearing was, was just thrifted. Um, and I think it's also important to have a color scheme. Uh, to have a identifiable color scheme. Like for Alicia, literally just all white. Dexter, her main colors were brown, like army olive green and blue. And those were always the colors associated with Dexter and things I would wear. And kind of that was like the whole vibe, right? I could wear an army green jacket and then like a you know brown pants and it kind of just fit her aesthetic. Like you create a character aesthetic, almost like a brand for that character. And I think when you do that, not only is it like is it good for you because it's easier to pick things out and, and buy things because you're like, oh, this is my aesthetic for this character. This is how I want them to look. And so you can just keep adding on to that because I played this character for five years. Her closet is insane. Like I have like 40 tubs worth of clothes just for this character alone. Um, and when you have that, that aesthetic or that, that look that you want that drives your character, it makes it easier to plan things out, buy things for it, etc. cetera. Um, can I pause here to switch out the battery pack? No problem. Are, are we good? Are we good? Okay, we're good. Okay, hi. Um, all right, so wings. I, I know we uh, we just talked about wings. Um, I'm also going to recommend against wings. <laughs> um, uh, I I have worn anywhere between these wings are four feet tall, um, and they are wide. They're about two and a half feet wide, like from my back. So they were heckin' uncomfortable and heckin' cumbersome, but I did it, I did it for the, the, the care, I did it for the aesthetic. It, it was, it was, I did, I sacrificed a lot of things for the aesthetic, but like, it was so cool, I wanted to like, I was like, I'm sweating, so real, like, you have no idea, in this photo, I'm dying. I want to die in this photo, like, I was sweating so much, it was the middle of August, and I'm like, I'm sitting here, oh, wait, did you take the picture yet? Oh, okay, good. Oh, like, <laughs> um, but I, I think, depending 
on what you're doing, and like this was an NPC role. So I had only had to be this character for maybe like five hours for the event. So I do feel that sometimes to make that impact, yeah, it's okay if you know you're not going to wear it for the whole week. I wasn't this character for the entire weekend. Sometimes it's kind of like when you do cosplay, you just have like a big cumbersome thing, but it looks cool for the moment. You're gonna wear it only for three hours, so it's it's like you'll live with it. It's fine. I think that that I don't think there is a problem kind of going over the top of your costume though, as long as you're not hurting yourself. Okay, like don't hurt yourself. Um, but I think sometimes that if, if you if it feels right for you, go go ham. I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, I'm going to bring up, arguably, um, one of my most iconic characters. Actually, no, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna ask you a question first. How much did you think that dress cost? It's okay, just scream it out. I don't care. How two, much did you? Two fifty. Two fifty? Hundred bucks. Fifty. <laughs> Depends on how the embellishments were done. Because mm. I'm, I'm having a hard time picking out things like that. Tell us. It was a thrifty dress for a hundred bucks. Mm. And it was ha hand dyed. It, it was actually dyed gray, but the gray base was a purple, so it came out as a beautiful, like purpley gray. Um, I wore this to Fairweather Manor, and people lost their damn minds. They were like, "How much did you pay for that dress? Like, what?" I'm like, "Guys, it was a hundred dollar dress." And they're like, "What? No way!" And I'm like, "Yeah, because I'm very much in the park of it's how you wear it. It doesn't matter how much something costs. It's about how you, what you add to it." What makes the costume come alive isn't the costume, it's you inside of it. And for me personally, costuming is what makes me feel the most in character. If I, I like to look in the mirror and feel transformed. If I am transformed, I bring that outfit to life. Because, sure, you can have a really nice dress, but if you're not feeling it or it's not like fitting you as that character, you're not living in it, it, it yeah, sure, it's a pretty, it'll just be a pretty dress. It won't be something that's like iconic or like something that's like, oh, this is for like my character, this is this character. You get what I'm saying? Um, now this is what I want to show you. Um, actually, oh, I keep like diverting. Um, this is also this, so this was taken at Fairweather Manor. Um, this is the Chobach Studios LARP. Uh, it took place in uh, 1917, and that dress that I'm wearing, that white dress. Okay, we're answering another question. How much do you think that white dress costs? Fifty bucks. No idea. <laughs> That if it we're gonna go with the final answer, that dress cost me eleven dollars. Eleven dollars. Oh, wow. And when I got it, um, you see how the sleeves are kind of see-through? The top was kind of also see-through like that, and I was like, hmm, that's not gonna fly. <laughs> so I worked with a friend of mine and we found a way to use uh, just a just t-shirt, like an old white t-shirt to line the inside so that it was Ooh. opaque. Um, and then that little hat I bought online for like off of eBay for I think the hat was more expensive than the dress, so I'm honestly thinking the hat was like 20 bucks. Um, and, and then those are just gloves I got from Amazon. And it, that's all it takes. It's just these little details. And that $11 dress to make it fit tighter, I, um, we added on ribbons to the waist because I was wearing a period corset underneath. And we just tied it and it looked, it looked great. So you can make little, it's all about the details. It's little things. And it's also about your foundation. Um, I think what a lot of people get intimidated about, like sometimes with historical events such as Fairweather Manor, it's like, well, how do I get that look? Like, you know, the girls with the tiny waist and the, you know, how, how do I do that? How do I get that look? Well, that's, you can really wear any dress. You can wear an $11 dress over what your foundation garments are because if your foundation garments are proper or like, or set or look for the period, anything you put over it is gonna look great. So underneath that, I was wearing, um, I actually have a picture of my period underwear. On, um, thank God I'm, I always overshare. Um, so I had gotten um, a set of underwear, and that this it's like these kind of things. Your foundation and your base is what's going to make anything over it look great. I feel I'm, I'm very. If you invest in your base, right, you won't have one. You just make that investment once because you can always reuse any of these things. And two, it's going to make the silhouette look the way you want. It's gonna make, and you can make an $11 dress look like a $200 dress just because you have the right cinch or you have the right shape. Um, so I had, I wore all these hip pads, and we're like, uh, so this tied, um, so this tied around the waist. These are actually period accurate, so these were open crotch bloomers. Um, and that's, it didn't go into the bathroom so easy when you're wearing one of those dresses. Like, <laughs> um, and then I had a, um, a share piece. 
and then I have a corset cover over it. So this is the corset cover that you're seeing with bust-enhancing ruffles. So when you see these girls from that era, um, technically my costuming was mm, towards the earlier part of the century rather than the later, but it worked with my character because Fair Weather Manor is it's like not historically accurate, it's like historical inspired. So like you can fudge some things. And that's the whole thing, is like kind of getting an idea of what you can fudge a little bit. And, I, and getting an idea of like, oh, it doesn't really have to be wool or like cotton, or it doesn't have to be an actual dress with a pattern from, you know, 1910. It could be an $11 Kohl's dress, it's fine. You know, um, because when you have those foundations, then everything will work. And this is the corset that I wore underneath it. I'm also, a, a a professional tight lacer, so you, but you don't have to cinch your waist that small or like 18 inches. You don't have to do any of that. It, it's it's more of the principle behind it. You can get really nice cheap courses that hat will give you a similar silhouette without cinching, you know, six inches in your waist or or doing anything like that. And I'm, I'm um, and but having the having that corset, sure, I I bought it, but I have used it six times since I bought it to use it as foundation for other garments, regardless of the time period. Because again, as long as you have it, I mean, again, you can, you can fudge it to make it work. Um, moving on from like historical design and whatnot, um, arguably my most iconic character is my character Rosalina Timbottom uh, from the College of Wizardry. Uh, I design, Rosalina is purely my own design. So I went to College of Wizardry 12 uh, last year in March, and I was like, hmm, I want to do something different. I always approach character design and uh, costume design as, what can I do to challenge myself? What's different this time? What else can I do, right? Um, and I was like, huh, what about space magic? And I contacted the team, I was like, hey, do you guys have any info on space magic? They're like, no, but you can, you can write space magic. I'm like, I'm gonna write space magic. <laughs> and I, I'm thinking, okay, what, um, what can I do that's different? Because I love white wigs and like white hair on me. I think on my skin tone, it, it, it really has a nice effect. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I ha it, has a, it has a really nice effect. And so I, I went with white hair. I had these purple cheeks, um, because in the story, she had used a cosmic element in her magic and it backfired on her and it turned her hair white and added a purple hue to her skin. Um, now, I'm, I'm a person of color, so I can't recommend use purple on your face to maybe paler skin tones because it might make you look bruised, bruised and dead. Um, but on, on me, it's, it's more like an accent blush on my skin. Um, and so I had these, I had these sparkly like, you know, purple cheeks with these white freckles, and that became iconic. Um, the white hair, the purple cheeks, and that hat. That's it. That's what makes Rosalina. I can wear anything else. I can wear a t-shirt and jeans. And as long as I have those elements, that is Rosalina. And when you make your character, think about that. Like, think about what are my two, my one, two, three key elements that are going to make this look my character. That anybody, regardless of whatever costume I wear or where people see me, they know that's so-and-so. They know that it's Rosalina. They know that it's that. If I leave that hat anywhere, everybody's like, oh, that's Rosalina's, that's Rosalina's hat. You know, um, and I think that's one of the uh, more interesting parts about design. Um, this is another character I have. Uh, her name is Estrella Meliette. She was from Ar Armistice Arcane. And uh, my challenge with her was she was part of the circus. It was taking place, the war was taking place in the, um, alternate Victorian history. And she's kind of like a diva, and she was also a, a second generation French immigrant, right? So I'm like, okay. If she's a diva, if she likes like Marie Antoinette and all these things, how can I blend all these things together? And when now we're you know we're going on from talking key elements about a costume, what makes key elements of an era, right? So in the Victorian era, you immediately go to corsets, you immediately go to you know like probably like vest or like tight things that show form, bustles, you know that kind of typical thing, right? What do you think when you think Rococo, like Marie Antoinette era France? Big hair! You think of the makeup, you think of the cheeks, and I'm like, okay, let's combine those elements along when you think of a circus, stripes, diamonds, all those kind of things. So I basically took the uh, most prominent elements from each of those categories and put them together. So my face and my hair is very much, you know, Marie Antoinette, while my outfit is still uh, Victorian because it's form fitting, has the, you know, our jabot here petticoats, yet it has a circus element because I have my diamonds on it, I'm wearing striped socks, and it all kind of gives you that performer kind of circusy look. And so my challenge to you guys is to think 
You know, what, are, what is my color scheme? You know, what would be my key elements? If you're working for an error, what are the key elements that make that error? And how can I fudge them or work them into my costume? This is not a period Victorian costume, but you've got those elements, and even though I was in that world with people who did have period accurate costumes, it still fit. It didn't feel out of place, you know? And I think that's something to strive for in whatever you're designing. I'll stop talking. Artsis Arcane is currently ongoing. Artsis Arcane 2, unfortunately, is sold out, but will be taking place in um, in January. But there's there is going to be a third one, so yes. you know. Uh, I may or may not like carnival stuff. Yeah, no, the the circus the circus the circus the best group, but don't tell anybody I said that. It's the best group. Um, you can also follow me at Raquel Skellington. I'm, I'm that on everything. If you we just saw people, we just. Are you New York City based? Uh, yes, I am. I'm based in New York. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, I'm going to a website too because I didn't make a PowerPoint. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to be taking you to our Tumblr. Um, we're in the process. Is it really Event LARP LARP? No, it's Event Horizon LARP, and I just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. That's event LARP LARP. Event LARP LARP. That was like a um, secret way to hide your tumbler. There we go. Better. All right. Um, we're in the process of transferring things over, but right now this is still where all my fashion posts are. So, um, I, um, I'm going to be talking mostly about costuming from a LARP designer perspective. Um, I'm the head aesthetic designer for Event Horizon. It's a blockbuster LARP, um, and it's a LARP where all of the adults are costuming themselves at home. So I'm used to a summer camp environment um, where I, as a costumer, costume, you know, 60 children at once. And I get to make sure the PC groups look coherent, they look I get to do the overall aesthetic of the game. I get to make sure that all of them look consistent, that you can tell, oh, those are the monks, and oh, those are the warriors. I get to make sure that all happens for them when I'm costuming them as groups. When I was moving into like Blockbuster LARP and moving into like, oh, like I'm, all of these adults are gonna be out here costuming themselves. How do I, as a designer, um, create looks that they can emulate, that they can do at home, and also looks that are going to indicate what their alliances are, what their jobs are, what their groups are, and um, indicate our setting. Um, we're a sci-fi setting that is kind of space opera-y. It takes place over um, six home worlds and various colony planets. Um, so I'm looking at like fashion and sci-fi, um, but also I'm looking at a lot of diversity and aesthetic. I need people to be able to indicate through fashion what planet they're from um, and be identifiable. Um, but also it's like, okay, I need to indicate that I'm from Barrios, but I need to indicate that I'm also a reporter. And how do I make it possible for players to do both of those things at the same time? So um, what I started doing is designing these aesthetic posts um, for players. Um, I'm going to show you one right now. This is Dawn Lighters, which um, is a religious group. Um, the, um, this post is a combination of reference images, text, uh, logos I designed for it. Um, I make Pinterests for all of the groups that usually have high fashion inspirations. Um, and then I also make polyvores for all of the groups that have more affordable, what you're going to easily be able to find in stores, options um, for buying clothes in that aesthetic. Um, so I'm also big on tying costuming into world building. Um, and when you're looking at it from a designer perspective, when you're doing it as a player, you're like, all right, how do I look at the world building that's already happened and like, bring my costume to that world. When I'm doing it from a design perspective, I modify world by the aesthetics I create. Um, I always um, talk about why different materials are common on this planet. If I'm, I think about class 
a lot when I'm designing aesthetics. Um, so certain planets, uh, only high class people would have access to things like leather. Um, certain planets only, um, it would be a lower class material because that means that you're like farming and using your own animal skins. Um, when you're thinking about access to resources, that influences aesthetic. Um, when you're thinking about um, what act, like what is valued in that culture, that influences aesthetic. So a lot of times I start with like, oh, this is a cool thing I'd want to wear and it feels right. And then I go back and I'm like, how does that connect to the world? What implications does that have about the world? And what is it going to influence out from there? Um, so this is looking at space station and military fashion. Fashion, I was thinking about how, um, how military fashion would change when you're not doing military combat on planets, when you're doing it all in space. And therefore, I was thinking about what would be the easiest uniforms in space. And I, I landed on um, white. When you are planet side fighting, it makes sense to have camos, it makes sense to blend into your environment. If you're fighting in a spaceship, you want something that you can throw it all in the wash together and bleach it, and it's going to be clean for your whole crew, right? <laughs> so um, I think it's really fun and interesting to think, to like have that conversation between aesthetics and world building. Um, and like I'm lucky that with Event Horizon, I'm in a position to do that. Um, and then there's the matter of presenting that information to your players, right? So I design all of these things and then I have um, individual blog posts. Um, right now they're on Tumblr. We're moving them over to our website as soon as I have free time. Um, so the posts are consist of, again, like a lot of high fashion reference images, um, descriptions of how the aesthetic ties into the world building, um, and then practical advice on how to achieve those specific looks. Um, so it's like, I talk a lot about fit, I talk about what kind of fabrics are gonna fall the way that you want, um, as well as like, I do talk about world building what materials will be used, but I also talk about how you can fudge it. Um, like, you don't need, I, I'll be like, oh yeah, this planet, they use a lot of like natural fibers. You don't have to do that, you can fudge it, use a blend, it'll be cheaper, um, but it's gonna still fall the right way, you know? Um, and looking at fabric texture. Um, so like for Space Station, I'm like, cool, um, I don't expect you guys to buy these like weird, like avant-garde designer things that are like inspirations for me, but you can look at them and be inspired by them, and here are things that I've found that are more affordable that have similar lines. Um, have similar cuts um, to them. So, um, yeah, so we're also talking about designing um, a ton of different aesthetics for this world and making them all distinct and recognizable, um, and giving players enough space to play and find their characters within each of those aesthetics. So, um, the two we just last saw were a religious group and a military group, and this one is one of our planets. This is uh, uh, the planet Gear, and then we did new Gear fashion. Uh, Gear is a, um, a planet based around sailing, um, primarily. It's like a water-based planet with a lot of like islands, and a lot of their um, culture was based around traveling over the ocean, um, warfare um, in, by ship, um, fishing, and uh, migration. So one of the things that I took was the, I took a big inspiration from um, sailing not work. And I was like, cool, this is my inspiration point for this, and how am I gonna incorporate that into the fashion uh, and make that recognizable? Um, and also make it accessible, because again, I take, I love high fashion. Uh, I make Pinterest boards for all of these, I can't afford high fashion, I'm thrifting, I'm looking at like, dis like whenever there's a sale at stores I like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have to be expensive to look expensive. Oh no, totally not. Um, but yeah, uh, it also, um, 
Actually, this one is a good place to also talk about the interplay of character and costume that I try to foster. Because I try to give people a way to connect their, um, their costume to the, their character's culture. Um, but I also, I think about designing costumes in two ways when I'm costuming myself. And I want to give people the opportunity to also do that. I think about what's going to make my character look and read to other people, like Raquel was talking about. And I think about what is something that makes me feel like I'm embodying my character. And for me, those are often wildly different things. Um, for uh, Gira fashion specifically, I had something built in. Um, this planet was destroyed and most of the people in game are, uh, dias are a diaspora. Um, so what I incorporated is, since they were already a nomadic culture, having a tradition of carrying small bottles of soil of your home island. Um, so, and like wearing that as jewelry. So I had that, it's, um, there's a description of it here, they're like little bottle pictures over there of things that you can do. Um, I had that because I knew that if I was thinking about playing, um, playing a Gira character, having something like that would be a focus piece for me that wouldn't be flashy, it wouldn't be super noticeable by other characters, but like in a quiet moment, it's something like that I could feel like hanging around my neck or that I could like rub my hands over. And like incorporating small parts of your costume to ground you in your character um, can be super powerful. Um, it can allow you to be in character even when you're alone, um, which is honestly some beautiful quiet times that happen in LARP. Um, yeah, but then, yeah, you also want to externalize um, parts of your character. Um, it makes your character recognizable. Um, it also indicates, they, it lets people know certain things about your character right off the bat. Um, maybe you have to decide when you're building a costume what you want people to know about your character. Um, for some people, it's home planet first and foremost. For some people, it's their job. Um, status. Status is conveyed via costuming. Um, if you are rich or poor, uh, and how you carry yourself um, can all be aided by costuming. Uh, I Sometimes when I play really high status characters, I want to wear something that's tight on my shoulders because I know it makes me have my shoulders back and I can feel it the whole time and I'm conscious of it. Um, and also, like, thinking about, I'm designing aesthetics for a world that doesn't exist, right? But you also have to think about what modern indicators we have and what modern notions attached to things are going to carry through subconsciously. Um, a suit jacket, if it's like well tailored and stuff, is still going to carry status no matter what setting you're in. So while suit jackets might not be my favorite like sci-fi look, if I'm looking to play like high-powered corporate and evil, that's still something I'm going to look at to draw from because people already have that association there. And if my costume is going to start getting across my character faster, if I do that, it's maybe worth it to make that decision for my costume. Um, so I like color theming groups. Uh, it can be, listen, I started out in LARP summer camp. With kids, you're just like, all right, you're all green and you're all red, and now you know which adult you're supposed to be following around because you're wearing the right tunic. It's still super helpful with adults to yes. immediately be able to look at someone and be like, oh yeah, you're part of the private security team. Oh yeah, you're part of, um, I don't know, uh, the Gira Cultural Center. Like, color is such a strong, immediate visual indicator. It really, really is. Um, so I, um, let's see if I can find a list. Yeah, I include color schemes, suggested color schemes as part of all of my fashion group design. And for, since it's for adults, they're designing their own costumes, it's not just one color. But I try to have colors that have like a similar feeling to me, a color scheme that works well together, that people can pick and choose and draw from, and hopefully it'll still create some group cohesion there. 
Um, because, yeah, I'm looking for group recognizability and from a designer standpoint, and then I'm looking for people to come in and show me something about their character, um, and then hopefully have something personal for their character as well. Um, it's like a fun, a fun combination. Um, yeah, people have already talked a lot about this. I, um, I feel like I'm maybe a middle ground as far as like practicality on costuming here. <laughs> Don't follow me. I'm bad. Um, I mean, I'm also a cosplayer, so I do that for cosplay. I do not do it for LARP because I know myself, and if my shoes are pinching, I'm going to be focusing on that and not on my character. Um, shoes is the number one thing I recommend you sacrifice. Yes. First thing you sacrifice for your setting, shoes. Wear comfortable shoes. I tell my players this all the time. I'm like, so true. Listen, I want you to look good. I did all these posts, I did all this design because I'm invested in you looking good. If your shoes are ugly, and that's gonna make it so that you can walk this mountain, that's what I want. <laughs> like, way more than you look having cute shoes. Um, it is definitely like, Especially because um, I LARP a lot outside. Um, like balancing comfort and practicality and the aesthetic and the look is super important. Um, and as a game designer, you want to be giving your players advice on that. Um, you probably have more experience with your land and environment than they do. Um, and also in a creative fit and frenzy, they will forget. Um, and. Uh, yeah, it's it's nice when players when if you remind players to bring jackets so they don't show up at costuming during the weekend being like I'm freezing. I'm like that's that's real, but common sense. Uh, common sense before the look sometimes. Um, so yeah, reminding your players to consider their own comfort and also reminding them of. Um, the physical requirements of the LARP and the way that your land is is a great thing to do as a, when you're thinking about costuming for your event. Um, and if you have an event that's going to be colder, uh, in character outer layers, especially like warm winter coats and stuff, can be super, super difficult to find, especially on a budget. The thicker fabric is and like the actually warmer it is, usually like that ups your price point. Um, so if you're doing outdoors, winter, or late fall cold stuff, you want to be making sure you're getting advice to your players about that really, like, way, way far in advance. You want to make sure if they're playing outside and they want to be in costume outside, that they're thinking about warm outer layers. Um, definitely, definitely think I've had problems with. Um, Oh yeah, I'm also going to take a brief segue into um, gendered costuming for your LARPs because, um, you know, I'm the queer uh, forever. Uh, I think it's super important to design around, a, to include a variety of gender presentations in your costuming as a LARP organizer and designer. Um, for Event Horizon, it's easier than historical because we are looking at a future with a myriad of gender, gender presentation differences. Um, it is, clothing is by default gender neutral in this setting. Uh, in my like perfect fantasy ideal, uh, clothing is actually perceived by players as gender neutral when you're in this game. It's not possible. Um, it's not because people are, again, bringing in their preconceived notions of what indicates gender and what clothing is gender. Um, so you have to, yeah, you have to design with that in mind as well. Um, and also, but also, like, I super strongly encourage, like, in your examples of fashion, um, mixing it up with gender, uh, like, Skirts and dresses, especially, um, men can wear them. Make settings where it's socially acceptable for men to wear skirts and dresses. Um, it can be super great. Uh, in the future, there is absolutely, in sci-fi, why would that be a gendered item of clothing anymore? 
there's not really great reason. Um, and a lot of, and when we're looking at fantasy too, robes, guys, those are just dresses. They really are. We put, we put kids in dresses all the time, and these little boys will be like, I don't want to wear a dress. We're like, oh, it's okay, it's a robe. And they're like, oh, okay, like Gandalf, I'm set. Um, and it's about, it is a, it's easier with kids. It's about recontextualizing, and even when you're designing for adults, as a designer, you can start doing that work to recontextualize um, clothing and the way clothing is gendered for your game. Um, and yeah, clothes are fun. I don't see a lot of like clothing design docs or um, costuming tips beyond like high fantasy, sci-fi, dystopian for a lot of games. And I would really love to see more of it. Um, as game designers, don't dive deep into your aesthetics. Aesthetic design can be a great way to reinforce themes in your game, to set tone, um, and it's super fun. It's really fun. Um, I think that like at the end of the day, costuming is, it's not an essential part of LARP. You can LARP in theater blacks, you can LARP in a fucking nerd t-shirt, it does right. not matter. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Who costume for you? For me though, like, uh, costuming is essential to life for me. Same. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that for people it's personally important. Yeah. Yes. I, it's personally important to me because I love it. Um, but I think it's like, as a designer, I want it to be something that we play with more instead of something that we uh, are like, players will figure that out. Um, because it is really fun. And I do feel like it's, yeah, this fun aspect of LARP instead of like, a chore or a huge like monetary investment and burden. And that's, that's, I just wanted to comment on your shoe thing really quick. I'm going to tell you right now, even with some of those fancy fancy outfits or things that I put on, I have literally used the same shoes like 40 times with four different characters and nobody's noticed. And like, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not a shoe person, okay? So like, I, I do, like for Victorian LARP, I have like these brown shoes that I love because they're super comfy and they're like the only ones I wear. I wear them for Fairweather Manor. Rosalina from College of Wizardry. I am wearing them again at Fairweather Manor. Like, it, if somebody comes to me and whines about my shoes, I'm like, then I feel like I did something wrong because they're not looking at the rest of the outfit. So, like, you know, but yes, on the shoes thing. Like, I don't sacrifice comfort for shoes. Like, not, not with the shoes. No. Yeah. This, this costume guide is one of the best that I've seen for Royal LARP. Uh, uh, yep. There's, yeah. there's a, another one that does a really good job with it, it is Obscurus Cult. Uh, does I a really got good job with their, uh, their uh, we're in run two in Amsterdam in June. But like, I just um. Yeah, sorry, no, it's okay. Uh, I just want to know if we have any questions. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I just want to say we are slightly over time. Oh, um, never mind. We, we got a little delayed with the AV problem oh. initially, so. Well, um, do we still get to ask questions? Yeah. yeah well, so I was going to say, uh, I would, I, if, if people come, we'll they, we can continue with the Q and A. I just want to make sure people were yeah. time. Yeah. So, uh, and, and if people do leave, I just want to thank. Our, our panelists for the great <laughs> uh, Yeah, uh, questions? So I, I've been asking this question in every panel because I think it was fascinating. From the keynote earlier about uh, pillars versus parasites, I think that costuming is one area in which there's a big divide in how players approach it and feel comfortable approaching it. Now you are a group of very talented costumers and there's a lot of other costumers who might take inspiration. Do you have any ideas on how we can use costuming to, to reinforce that, how to be a pillar instead of a parasite in the community? Um, can we like go down? Yeah. Or, yeah. I want to make sure. Okay, you can start. Okay, uh, I think that costuming absolutely can be a barrier to entry uh, at a lot of different LARPs. Uh, monetarily, clearly, like needing to spend more money to go to an event, an event is a barrier for a lot of LARPs. And I think that um, if you have experienced costume designers um, who are um, open and able to give that advice very freely, um, and also to give solutions that are thrifty and solutions that are easy, because um, one of the best ways that you can create a costume is literally just do different layers. Yep. And you can just pull something out of your thing. But I think the best thing we can do is like help our friends. Like if you are an experienced costumer, like please give your advice to others, especially if you if you can see that they are confused or something. Like yeah. we need to have a mentor uh, relationship with our players. Yes, yeah. and I'm, I'm very much in that camp. Um, my whole theory is just 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 try a little. Like that's it. That's look, just just try a little. That, that's it. That's all I would ask for is just, just try a little. 
Um, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be X or Y. Everybody starts somewhere. And I think that's what people forget. Everybody starts somewhere. And the costume you have the first time you LARP the, uh, or, or versus five years of LARPing, it's going to be a lot different. And I think what happens is a lot of people see what's out there and they, they, they do get intimidated by it. I'm not going to sit here and, and say I haven't had people come to me and be like, wow, it was really inspiring, but I was also kind of intimidated that I had to match what you did. And my, I might always make it very clear, especially in a lot of my videos, I do what I do because I like it and it's, it's fun for me personally. Right? I, I would never, I think the key thing with a lot of communities is that it has to be known that if you have a high cost, not everybody has to hit that expectation. You know, you, I do not expect people to go as hard or as ham as I do. And I think that's important for new players to also know is that like, just, just try a little. That's, that's it. You know, I'm always willing to help uh, people. When I, when I get invited and I, and I um, you know, because I, I do get the privilege of, of getting invited to LARPs, when I go, I make sure that I always let people know, hey, I, I, let me help you. I can do this. Oh, you need to get a costume. Oh, you only have a $60 budget? Let's go on Amazon together. Like, let's go on eBay together. I'm going to make you look great no matter what your budget is. And like, always, it's always helping people. Mentoring. That's what's important. You know, aesthetic is nice and all, but making sure somebody feels comfortable in their own costume is what's most important. Um, yeah, you guys summed it up really well. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, as an organizer, what I do is com encourage that on community Facebook pages. Yeah. Um, be like, anyone have costume progress? Anyone have costume tips? I drop like casual tips sometimes. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, I was walking through H&M and I saw these three shirts that like really looked like our setting and were like, you know, 10 bucks. Um, so offering like casual small advice and breaking it down and making it less scary, I think is really helpful. Yeah. Um, the other thing is like I'm instituting as an organizer is um, I think I'm going to start like explicitly mentioning using theater blacks for all of my games um, because ultimately if you cannot costume, if that's a barrier to you, I still want you to play my LARP um, and then it's like theater blacks, you're not distracting from the game, you're like not going to ruin the group photos with like like copyrighted logos, and you can still come and have a good time, and people are still going to play with you. And I think, uh, honestly, a thing that we I, should, I want organizers to do and move forward doing with their communities for their LARPs is to have people that are maybe captains of that kind of thing and mm -hmm. that can lead that. Have the organizers put forward people that volunteer and be like, hey, so it also if you're worried about cost, you can you know consult us, but these are also some other players that are willing to help you and like you know put put the people who are willing to help out there because I, I've also heard a lot of times that parents are like, oh, I would have loved to know if I could have you know, come to you kind of thing. They're like, oh my god, I didn't even know. I've just been talking to the designers. So it's important for the designers to also take that step to be like, hey, these are also people, leaders in the community that, that you can talk to about this thing. We probably have time for one question before I have to barricade the doors. <laughs> you, you have your hand up for a bit. Okay. How do you guys go about approaching the situation where like, you stuff you need to hold. Like, what did, do you have like a specific tactic for like getting a bag or a backpack or a point purse or whatever it is that you're using? Absolutely. Um, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, my rule is that it either I have two things. It's the same thing. The same rule applies to shoes. Okay. It's either part of the outfit and it looks with the aesthetic, or it's simple enough where nobody fucking notices it. Period. That's it. I have two things. If I'm going to wear, if I'm going to wear a bag as Rosalina. Either it's going to match her entire aesthetic, space theme, or Labusa house themed, or like totally be, or it's going to be a cheap black bag that nobody will pay attention to. Same thing with shoes. Either the shoes go with the outfit, or it's a plain black shoe. We're wrapping up. We're wrapping up. Um, I would say the number of times I've sewn pockets onto an outfit, um, a lot of so I'm serious. Uh, and I have I have pockets that I can basically uh, grommet to the inside waistband of things to like put. Um, you know, credit cards, wallets, cash, that kind of stuff, in an outfit where, like, if I'm playing a satyr, like, yeah, I can probably use a pouch if I wanted to, but for the most part, like, why does it go with money? So, like, <laughs> like, I have literal pockets that I can attach to the inside of waistbands.